we are delighted to be having this lovely little connection and round table with you all this morning. You can decide if you, we did this in a Zoom meeting format, because we know sometimes in Q and A's, you can feel a little bit like, you know, disconnected. <laughs> so feel free to be on video if you wish. Um, we're gonna be doing a couple of things today. One is that we're gonna be answering your questions um, about Business School Bootcamp for Therapists, whether it makes sense for you, we'll share a little bit about that. And then if we have time, we'll also just answer your questions because we're here. Yes. And we wanna make sure that this is really valuable to you. Um, I think there is a lot that happens out in our field where we can be looking at people that are successful, they have full practices, they are launching a course, they're teaching on the side, they're providing clinical supervision, like whatever is happening. And realistically, what they're experiencing is that while they look successful from the outside internally, they do not feel successful in their household. They do not feel successful. Sometimes um, the finances are not there despite the amount of time they're working. Sometimes the finances are there, but then the life balance isn't. So then people are feeling like, well, this is great that I have this great business, but my relationships are falling apart. My friends haven't heard from me in months, whatever that piece is. So I think that is something that distinguishes boot camp from other programs. Our definition of success is when your practice is getting great clinical outcomes and you are also getting a great income and one is not sacrificed for the other. It's a tandem yeah. of you have the income you need for a really good balanced life yes. and you have a good balanced life that allows you to provide the great outcomes for your clients. And we work at how those kind of feed each other in this yeah. cycle. So yeah. you are valuable, you and your clinicians, honestly. Um, if you are running a group practice, there is no one else like you. And there has been this real training that we've experienced um, as clinicians. We are trained to overwork. We're trained to be burnt out. We're trained to um, put ourselves in such a low space in the world that we end up really living in a place of exhaustion and burnout. And that feels very normal. That feels like that's how it's supposed to be. Um, I'd love to see in the chat, have, have you experienced that in particular of feeling like, hey, like this is, I, I really learned lessons that don't feel sustainable. Like I learn lessons about business. I learn lessons about caseloads. I learn lessons about fill in the blank that are not really making this work for me. And in fact, for a lot of successful therapists who come to us and say, I want to launch a course. I want to expand into group practice. I want to do retreats more often than not. While that is a dream the actual motivation is that their life and their livelihood isn't sustainable right now. Their caseload is too high. Their income is too low. It's not just, wow, you know, my life is in balance and I have some space and I want to do this next thing. It's, I need an escape from what I've created. This isn't really working for me. And again, there is a, a percentage of successful therapists that are like, no, I'm space. I'm ready for the next thing. And I, like my life is sustainable, my income is sustainable, and now I'm ready for something else, something creative. But again, probably if you are one of those people that feels like I need this, I want this next thing, and partially it's an escape, partially it's a, I don't feel good about my finances, you are not alone. You're very, very normal. I also want to say how success changes your definition. For example, when we do the imperfect, perfect day exercise, if you've been to one of our previous um, trainings, we look at, you know, what that balance looks like, but then something can happen in life. Something can happen in our work and what we need to feel successful shifts. So this is something that you're constantly reevaluating. So it's never, um, it's never like this, uh, 
hard line of I have now hit success because you'll you'll hear talk of when I hit six figures like a number meaning success mm -hmm. but again it's if we're looking at balance what is balance if have you ever balanced on anything it's like this constant like like firing yeah. of the muscles back and forth <laughs> it's never just this total like standing in place with nothing, nothing being activated. Yeah. It's constant give and take. And so that's what we want you to learn in boot camp is how to, how to actually balance and be, be in tune with your body, be in tune yeah. in the sessions and be in tune with what is happening in your environment so that you can continue to push and kind of shift, you know, the business towards what's happening in your there. life. Um, Kelly and I, during the pandemic, anybody get any great hobbies during the pandemic? <laughs> um, paddle boarding was one for us. And part of what happens with paddle boarding when you start to do it is like initially you feel yourself start to shift. And so then you push down really hard with the other foot and then the other foot pushes down and you're doing this like crazy wobbly thing and you're working well, and, really you fall off. and you fall off. <laughs> Well, I fall off. Yeah, it falls off. Um, you, the more you kind of try to pay attention to it and you try to force yourself into balance, the harder it is. And what happens over time is that you become very mindful and really breathe and you have enough flexibility and strength to kind of almost effortlessly kind of balance. You also we'll learn when maybe there's a big wave coming, maybe there's a big wake, there's a boat going by and you're feeling it, you might naturally drop down to your knees, mm -hmm. right? So that you can like reassess until things settle down. Um, we were paddle boarding in Hawaii, oh, no. like, <laughs> like the one big vacation. I reassessed that we took I our, have done our families. Yeah, we all were like, that was a bad was day. Hard. It was a particularly like hard day. And so there's a lot of like reassessing, oh, this is what works at home. And here is what works right now on this really busy day or really windy. windy day of like, oh no, we really need to like reassess. And I think for a lot of us over the last two years, we may have had like a place where we're like kind of in flow and then suddenly things shift and change with the way that we're working, the modality, um, taking care of family members, being isolated from support networks, all these other things. And we have to adjust. This is not just something that happens during the pandemic, but I think that right. really brought it to the surface in a significant way that we need to have some adjustments. Um, I can't see. Oh, I can see. Kelly was saying how um, we're hitting the nail on the head for her, that life work balance has been very difficult in mm -hmm. practice in Zipalea. Um, was saying that it feels very important to know because she judges herself when she doesn't have things in perfect balance. Perfection is kind of elusive, isn't it? It's, it's such, um, it's such a big piece. And I think also for a lot of us that are in the psychology field, um, I guess I'll ask the question, how many of you got like pushback from people when you went into psychology saying like, can you really make a living doing that? Are you really making a, like, is this really a good decision? Is that a real job? Is it like, real science? Is that real science? Like there's one. a lot that like comes up sometimes. And so we can kind of come in from a place where we're feeling like we have to like prove our value and prove our worth to the people outside of us. Um, and so this like pr constant proving of ourselves it, there's never enough, right? You, you end up in this place where you can sometimes be 10, 20, 30 years in practice, still struggling with this like deep internal sense of like, am I good enough? Um, is what I've done with my practice or my business good enough? Um, can I really sustain this mm -hmm. or is everything going to kind of fall apart? So then on top of balancing this, some people say, well, why would I do boot camp if I'm successful? Like maybe I have found the balance. Um, I'm good. And a reason that a lot of people continue to do boot camp even after being successful are twofold. One is to refine and keep pushing that, that kind of balance point of saying, wow, I, I'm good, I like it, but could it even be just a little better? What are some systems I can automate more? What are some, what is, 
you know, I've got this level. Now, could it get just a little bit better? Can I push the outcomes a little better? Could I simplify my processes a bit more? Could I outsource more and reduce even more time? It's sort of, I remember like when I first started taking time off, I kept like pushing, okay, I took two weeks. What if I took three? What if I took four? What if I took a month? And I just kept seeing like, how, how far can, how good can this really be? The mm -hmm. other side of it is that sometimes when you arrive to this balance point, there is enough room and enough flow and creativity that you want to explore other options. We're not talking about, oh, stuff isn't working in my practice and I want, I want an exit hatch with like doing a course. We're talking about those that, that being in that place where you find the stability and now you feel at ease to move into um, move into something new. And then when we do that, then we have to rebalance again and go through the same boot camp process for adding in other streams of income, speaking, teaching, supervision, group practice, whatever that may be. Yeah. And it's an interesting place. Um, you know, right after this, we're going to be doing a Q&A with a lot of group practice owners. And those are individuals who often came into this place of like, I'm successful, um, I'm full, and there's more need than I can, um, I can actually um, manage on my own. And so we get into this place of then figuring out kind of what's next. And for all of those group practice owners, they really had to go back to um, again, successful people that they had to go and look at what am I really doing in my practice and what are the little pain points? Sometimes they're little, sometimes they're big pain points that are going to get replicated or extrapolated. They're going to get expanded and duplicated, triple, triple, triplicated. <laughs> they're going to just get like, continue. If you have something that's taking you 20 minutes um, per week that maybe doesn't, that could take five minutes when you then have 10 employees, <laughs> that becomes a huge issue, right? Yeah. If you have some issues with your marketing or with the way that you manage your finances, and then you move into a course, you're going to replicate the same things that didn't, that aren't kind of in flow into now marketing and pricing your course. Or you're gonna see those cracks get even wider in your practice. So yeah. like if your marketing isn't on point in your practice and then you add marketing to a course, not only replicate those issues, but these issues in your practice are going to get bigger and more in your face. Because yeah. again, there's less time and things start to get compressed and the cracks start to widen. Yeah, if all of your marketing is something that you are personally responsible for and then you move your focus over here and it's all about the course, then very quickly you can start to see that your practice starts to go down and it, now that you're marketing this new thing and that's a different thing and it has a learning curve about it, your income is probably not going up at the point that your income is going down over here. And so I've worked with a lot of um, clinicians who had a lot of frustration and also a lot of shame about the idea of, wow, I had my practice. I thought everything was good. And then I started to do this new thing. And suddenly it felt like my, my practice just crumbled so quickly. And this other course that I put my heart into that I love so much that everybody around me said, oh, I would enroll in that. Mm -hmm. I'll send my clients to that. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. It didn't happen. There's just crickets around. Yeah. You know? I, um, I just wanted to say, sir, is it Sarita was saying I piecemealed everything together and now I need better systems that help things flow smoother. And sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so when we are starting our practices, which will lead into Roxanne's question, when we're starting a practice, for example, if you're in that phase, you are doing your first baseline, right? Of this is what I think. This is what I think the policy should be. This is how I'm going to handle things. Mm -hmm. And then you test that baseline with real experience of having clients. And then from that, you learn where you want to make improvements. And so that's one of the things we want to help you with in boot camp is that reevaluation piece. And if you're just starting out, Roxanne asked, like, would boot camp assist with how to start the practice? Because in terms of business savvy, they feel completely lost. 
Yes, because what we want to do is give you better baselines than if you had piecemealed it, for example. That's why some people are saying, well, I'll wait and I'll do it for a little bit and I'll, then I'll do boot camp. And I'm like, that's going to be harder because <laughs> you're going to have to go back and fix things versus kind of starting out with a little higher baseline or improved, more tested baseline yeah. that you can then test against your your clients. And yeah, everything. Our, this the baseline of boot camp has been tested with literally thousands of therapists in multiple cities and multiple countries. practice and countries, um, rural areas, big areas, solo practices, group practices. And we get to have weird, even weird, like not one-off, but like 10 off experiences where it's like 90% of people don't have this experience, but maybe five to 10% of people do. We can give a checklist to say, Hey, ask this question, read this in your lease, um, make sure and do this because we have seen it happen multiple times that this is like, it's not very common, but when it does come up, it's huge. You know, like one of the pieces that we see and it, we felt so, so um, strongly about it that we actually licensed some some wording from another um, space is a court policy. The amount of therapists that don't have a court policy in place, except that I don't go to court. Well, when we're subpoenaed, we don't have an option <laughs> of whether we go. They do not policy. care about your policy. <laughs> but what we can do is make sure that a, if you're subpoena, you're going to get paid. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, what will happen? You have whether you have a private pay or hybrid or insurance-based practice, you may have to cancel an entire um, day of clients. Sometimes it's, it'll get rescheduled. You have to cancel two or three days and they don't care. They're not going to work around your schedule. Every once in a while, you'll get a judge that will, but it's not the norm. But what will happen is if you have a court policy in place that you have to get paid, then the person that subpoenaed you, the particular lawyer has to ensure that you're paid for you to be there. And that is magical, especially for those people that don't want to go to court because for a, an attorney to say, hey, I want to subpoena you. And then you say, oh, just a little reminder, here's my day rate for court. And then they suddenly look at that and go, oh, never mind. Because now there's a cost to that. Mm -hmm. There's no cost to having you lose a thousand or several thousand dollars for that lawyer. There's no cost to them at all. There is a cost if you have a court policy and a day rate for having to go to court. Yeah, that's an example of how we say, all right, that may be something like you were taught just to add this little thing in your informed consent. But if you're starting out, you're going to get this policy so that it could be more fleshed out for you and more protective of you. And, you know, if you've already started fine, then you're going to go back many, everybody goes to boot camp, updates their informed consent. You should be updating it every year anyway, reflecting on the past year, what have you learned and improving. And instead of judging or shaming yourself of, oh, I didn't have that. Why didn't I do that? It is learning and you don't know what you don't know until you figure it out. And so that's what we want to help you kind of think about some of the things that often get forgotten yeah. or kind of experienced through hard trials. Yeah. If we can help circumvent some of that, it can make the path through building your practice much easier, especially people who are going to group practice, hiring, outsourcing, all those kinds of things, the people side of running a business you know, aside from even just your clients, if you take that on, that's a whole other aspect too. I think that's one of the pieces too with group practice. We have seen a lot of um, full, pardon me, full successful therapists say, oh, the next logical step is to do a group practice. They keep their caseload the same. They hire some people, maybe as contractors, maybe as an employees, and they start bringing in new people, they're scheduling. Yeah, they're working a few more hours or maybe many more hours as they're expanding this group practice. Their expenses are going up because they're trying to provide space for them. And then suddenly they're like, oh my gosh, the top line of my business, I'm now making maybe a quarter or half a million dollars, but the bottom line of my business, my profitability actually went down 
and I'm working more hours. So my life balance went down and my profitability went down and my income went down. What did I do wrong? I'm literally paying to do more work, right? And so our program really dives deep into what, how can we set up a group practice so that it's really viable for everybody from the start so that you're paying people a good livable wage? Because what happens when you realize you're paying someone to come and work for you? You start to feel resentful. You start to feel maybe angry. You start to feel like ashamed. And then you feel kind of stuck. Like, well, what do I do? How do I change the split or how do I change the hourly wage or like, what do I do? And what do I do when the people that I hired are like, I really like this setup. And you're like, well, of course you do because this setup benefits you and actually exploits me. And like, oh wait, I've, I've created something that doesn't work. Right. Claire asks, you're talking a lot about group practice. How are you helpful to solo practices? Oh. Actually, when we started boot camp, I would say that that was primarily who was in the program and then was solo practice owners. And then as they grew into group practices, we've been adding more of the group um, practice component. We didn't originally have like things on hiring or those kinds of things, but even in a solo practice, you may hire an assistant. Um, we've help you around all that, how to do the job description, how to figure out the pay, how to do the interview so that you like get the best candidates and things like that. And then the different options for virtual assistant. But really, no matter whether you're a solo or group practice, we take you through a roadmap. And I don't know, Miranda, if you want to, should we screen share? I'm not sure. Um, but we take you through start to finish of sort of looking at, do you want me to screen share? I will, if you want me to. Um, well, let me over here. You oh, decide. let me get the, let me you talk <laughs> okay. and I'll get the material pulled up. So what we're looking at is those business foundations. And again, we're always kind of considering what aspects of your business impact clinical outcomes. And then we're taking you through the roadmap of creating the vision for your solo practice, establishing the boundaries in your practice. What are your processes and systems in place so that you get better outcomes? And again, more ease, more income, those kinds of things. Then we move into how to get that vision out into the world with your messaging, marketing, website, how to build a website. We have a click by click video of how to build a website on, um, sorry, I'm so sorry, um, how to build a website on so, um, Squarespace. And then we move into marketing and then a marketing analysis. I, I we both feel, <laughs> I'm not speaking for just me, but for both of us, I'll speak for, um, when it comes to marketing, one of the things is it's very different to just do marketing and say, I think it worked because the phone's ringing versus analysis. There is a part of us where we are set apart in that we are a bit data driven. We are, I have a little sticker on my laptop. So is Miranda, it says data beats opinion. I do believe in intuition. I believe in following your wisdom and your truth. And I also believe in looking at the numbers and seeing where things stand. So not only are we teaching the marketing, we're teaching how to learn from the marketing so you can refine it and improve it and not get stuck in this, well, I've always done it this way, so that's why I'm going to keep doing it. I don't know if you've noticed, but like on Instagram, we have, we've been doing some reels. Why are we doing that? We're testing a new way of being in the world. And why, why is that? Because we want to see what is going to shift the Instagram following, those kinds of things. But why is that? Because we were starting to get an increase of Instagram um, to our website. Why? So it's all decision based on data and really trying to help you analyze the marketing. So you're not doing all the things all the time, but that over time you refine it because we would like to see anybody in practice to get to the point where they do the marketing, but it isn't taking up all of their, their yeah. time. So do you want me to share this yeah. roadmap? This is the roadmap that we take you through. So this just shows you kind of what we go through and it's a step-by-step. -step, so 12 steps. And this, you know, you can click it and fill it out and all that kind of fun stuff. But first we get you connected 
Then we take you through how to have the conversations in your practice, whether you are a group owner, you have an assistant that works for your solo practice, or it's just you answering the phones. And whether you're talking to parents, couples, or individuals, we have different scripts and different scripts too for virtual versus uh, brick and mortar kind of practices. And I think this is a, a huge piece that a lot of, of business owners are spending too little or too much time on the phone and they're not really um, prepared to have people really understand what they're agreeing to um, when they sign up for therapy. And so right. that can look, that can lead to no shows, reschedules, people coming really inconsistently, people not really like engaged in with the process. So everything that we're doing through this process is to save you time and energy to really attract the clients you can get the best outcomes with, and then to actually prepare those clients to get great outcomes so that they will rave about you and refer their, refer their friends and family members to you um, as appropriate. And so we take you through that process. Then we go into really getting clear about, uh, we have some very specific kind of things we want you to focus on and developing your vision, looking at client-centered processes that make it easier for you and your clients. Again, apply to solo or group practice, how to get organized, um, and then moving into our magic dashboard. Now, this is a really large Excel document that people say is that's why that alone is worth the cost of, um, of boot camp. But basically it grows with you. So if you're a solo practice, it helps you figure out like, what is my ideal fee to allow for me to take vacation, pay for retirement, health insurance, all, what do I really need to be charging? Not just to eke by, but in order to make sure that I have a healthy life. Mm -hmm. And then we can move into, if you had a group practice, what would pay scales look like? What, you know, when do you break even? Did you know that when you hire your first clinician that you actually have some costs that you have up front that you don't break even right away? Mm -hmm. Then looking at what kind of benefits you could offer them. Then if you wanted to add speaking or group therapy or or other kinds of courses and we have calculators for that. So that's a big uh, focus in boot campus working on some of those financials and getting your financial house in order, both personally and professionally, tying it together, making sure you have a team to support you, whether that's just an accountant or an accountant and a book, bookkeeper and a financial advisor. And then we, we do work on some of the money mindset stuff and we are committed to looking at it from an intersectional kind of standpoint of understanding we all have different privileges, we all have different stories, and it's important to like understand the money stuff. Then we move into the marketing, how to write the message, which you got a taste of, just a taste of in our marketing masterclass. We work on revamping the website so that you improve your ranking and that your website, if you, for example, if we've been around for 10 years, that really works to our advantage for our ranking because we've been working the website for a very long time. And so um, the sooner you get it um, ranked, the longer you're gonna hold that position. And we wanna show you how to do that. I think this is another thing too. So I know we have this mix of people that happen to be on this call, but yes. we're talking more about successful practice in general. When you are starting from scratch, it's harder and you're a brand new business, it's a little harder to get to that first page of Google. But if you've been established and you've had a website for a while, making tweaks and understanding the SEO can actually have a bigger, faster impact. Yeah. Um, you can climb up the rankings more quickly than someone that's new. Now that's not to, um, you can rank new. You yeah. can rank new. We help people do it all the time. We've had people where they filled up their practice in six months from a brand new website yes. and they were done and what have you. Like, that's great. But even if you're someone who's saying like, oh, I haven't done this stuff for so long and I have this, this website, it's never worked for me. Know that we can teach you how to make that website really work for you. Yeah. Um, then we work on a quarterly marketing plan that we teach that also coincides with an analysis of your marketing as well. And so we just, this is kind of the roadmap. And again, there's tracks. 
So if you're in group practice, there's some, some additional like lessons than when you're in solo practice. And so it's really there to grow with you no matter your phase of practice. Starting, started and struggling, I'm successful or successful and wanting to move into group practice or in group practice. And Melvin asks, I have a successful practice which I need to change how I'm doing. How can I work the boot camp around my practice? Absolutely. So you're going to go down the path, um, even if within the orientation of setting a schedule that really works for you and getting into that time. When we have a successful practice, it's very easy to get stuck with working in the business and not on the business. So we're just kind of keeping the plate spinning, but we're never taking a step back to look and go, wait, what plates do I need to put down? what's really working and what isn't. So we're going to really ask you to carve out some time to work on it. And we're going to start in with the vision and give yourself a little bit of freedom through boot camp in that module one to really reassess and say, you know, what, if I was to just tap into my own self and intuition, what would I be creating? What would really work for me? And then look in and adjust and say, oh, how, what is in line? What's already working? And what are the places that aren't? And then you'll be able to go step by step through our process to get everything aligned in with that initial vision, that initial perfectly imperfect day that you had, and make sure that we're carving out um, the vision that you want while also maybe even like smoothing out the pitfalls that maybe you've already experienced, but maybe you haven't yet, right? So we're gonna clean up things that you haven't even noticed you're going to take care of things that you have noticed, but maybe you didn't know how or what the easiest way to like make those shifts were. And then you're going to go through that whole process and at the end go, oh, wow, this is an entirely different practice. And then you're going to be able to kind of do that work, sit with that practice. And then maybe you come back in six months and then reassess and go, okay, I've been living this new life and I've been living this new practice for the next, last six months. Now, let me reassess again. Let me tap in what's working and what isn't. And usually it's that second or third time through where like, now you're, you're like, okay, I've got everything. The basic foundation is there. Now I can really laser point in. Maybe there was an area that like the first time I wasn't ready to go there. In the way that I am now, maybe I'm ready to go into social media and I wasn't before. Maybe I'm ready to really delve into my finances in a way that I wasn't before. So you'll dive down deep into that until you just feel rock solid in every area of your personal and professional life. Um, there is so much data um, for, for us with our clients in bootcamp that this doesn't just impact their professional life and impacts their personal life as well. That's the nice part is that you have data, mm -hmm. right? Not when you're starting out, you don't really have data, but when you've been doing it for a while and you're busy and successful, and then you're like, I want to do something. And you're like, but I don't have time. That is a red flag of, whoa, I successful for you might be shifting to a redefinition of, I have a practice that allows me to take time away, that allows me to work on the business, like Miranda is saying, instead of in it. And so what happens is when people have successful practices and they come into boot camp, there's a bit of like a, it's like an accordion effect. There's a squeeze and then a release of like, ooh, this is the stuff I need to change. And then as you change it, you start to find more expansiveness in your life. And then it's sort of like if a, another training came along or an opportunity came along, it wouldn't feel like, oh, how am I going to fit this in? You've created something that allows for that to come into your life with ease. Yeah. Is that helpful? I think so. I think those are great. It's, yes, that's true for me. <laughs> <laughs> we love these questions. Keep asking them. Um, and I think that, and if you want to, if you're maybe want to ask it privately with us, if you can just say that you want to send it to the, um, to us privately, um, and we won't say your name or you can um, raise your hand and we, can oh yeah, you. we can like talk like actual humans. <laughs> um, what? I know so crazy. You can raise your virtual hand or you can, um, take off your, make your video so we can see your face and you can 
raise this hand, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All that fun stuff. Um, I think it is, I, I think the other thing that's so important about um, successful practices in particular, taking some time to kind of reassess is that we, once you're successful, again, whatever that means, you are now mentors. You are someone that other people are looking up to. And if you've created something that doesn't really work for you and that doesn't feel good, that can be um, so incredibly painful. And sometimes we can inadvertently like bring other people down a path that we wouldn't really recommend, right? So on the surface, it looks great, but underneath, you know, your little feet are just going like a little duck in the water, but it looks so smooth on the surface, but you're just working and all the things. So we want to create a dynamic in our field. Like we are the worst paid master's degrees. Like when you pull up those top 10 lists, it's not just one, it can be multiple um, different degrees that are all not top 10 lists. Like that's, that doesn't need to be that way. And we don't need to be burnt out trying to provide good clinical care. When we read the stories of what happens for therapists when they lose their license, when they kind of burn out of the practice, you can see that this person has been struggling with burnout for a long time. The decisions that they're making are just so wild sometimes. And there's so much that they are, you know, they're, they're, their thinking has become distorted. And I don't think that I, yes, there, there's a small percentage of people that start out distorted that, you know, we need to find better ways to kind of redirect them. But I think there's a lot of people that over time, their thinking gets distorted as they get more and more burnt out. And then suddenly they are, you know, feeling just pain when they go to work, they're crying They're Now they, they spent so long and crying. Now they're like, rejecting of their clients, they're um, starting to resent them um, and be actively like hating them <laughs> and disliking yes. them. And that's not great. All right. I see someone raising their hand. Jill, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I think this was you saying. Or like, she's like, no, I was just showing my camera. And okay. Like, yeah, I was just saying hi because oh. I was running in late. Sorry. Oh, okay. No, it's no, okay. you're totally good. If you have a question for us, Jill's feel free camp. to ask. You're a boot camper. Yes. I am. Is am I in the right place? Yeah. Well, this is just the Q and A for boot camp, but we'd love for you to share. Like, how's it going? And are you going to join us this next round? Yes, I'm super excited. Yeah. Because um, the last one, I was like, it kind of came like quickly, you know? Yeah. I don't remember. Like, I think I joined after the master class or something, and then you started off right away. Is that what happened? Yes. yes. And so I didn't have time to really prepare and I didn't have time to like really block out a lot of scheduled time. So now I know like you guys said like, okay, October, whatever, we're going to like launch it or whatever. So I put that in my calendar a long time ago. Yeah. So I'm like, I have it in my brain. Like, okay, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of that time because last time I didn't really, cause I just, I didn't, well, I didn't have time to prepare for it. So, but I really have done nothing for my private practice. Good. And we're going to whip it back into shape. Uh, That's what this that burnout thing you were talking about. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't hate my clients. I love no. my clients. No, but, but it's time but for something. It, oh my gosh. I mean, the last year and a half, I mean, thank God my kids are finally in school. They have been not in school for a year and a half. Yeah. The last time my third grader was in school was in first grade. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. So I'm finding like, oh my God, I have time during the day to breathe, you know? So I'm really excited, but I don't really know if I have a question. That's no, okay. It's, okay. It's, it's good to see you. And I'm looking yes. forward to seeing you post this round. I think that's the other thing we've been calling boot campers actually to remind them of the upcoming working session. Yes, oh, I have a good idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, thousands of people I've been calling. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow. Okay, well, you can take me off your list. I'll be there. <laughs> um, 
But I think one of the things that has come up is that people forget you get to come back every round. That is amazing. I'm yes. so happy. I'm so yeah. excited. And I've been kind of like thinking, okay, I need to save up my questions and I need to think about it. And, but even just hearing other people's questions are so good too. Yes. You know, yes. I, I did participate in some of the Q and A's last time and that was really helpful. Good. I, well, I look forward to seeing this round. Thanks, yeah, Jill. Thank you. I, that's the other part too, which is so interesting. I don't know if any of you guys relate to this. We are so much more likely to carve out time for the clinical side of our business. So to go to a clinical training, to send that time, it is a different level of attention that we often give it. But the when you go through the bootcamp process, you're going to find that this has a huge impact on your clinical outcomes. We were just talking um, with someone who started boot camp after they were already established, but they were very new to it. And then they um, started. So 2018, they looked at their outcomes and their initial clinical outcomes of even just people having mutual terminations where both people are like, yes, versus dropping out of therapy they went from having mutual terminations in the 30% to 97% of mutual terminations. Like people really are connected in. They went from, oh, about a third of people are making significant progress to over 87% of people are making significant progress in the work that they're doing. And now that they have, they did make the decision to expand into group practice. Now they're teaching their clinician that as well. Uh, Zipalea, wait, I still am worried I'm going to get your name wrong. So can you just say one more time? Thank you so much. Yeah, Kelly, you got it right before. It's like a TZ. So it's Zipalea. Huh? Yeah. It's like, it's a, wait, am I loud enough? You're it's good. A, Okay, it's like a, it's Zipalea, like a TZ. Yes. So Zipalea just joined boot camp. Yes. How's it going? <laughs> so I'll just clue you in on what's going on. So we had three weeks of Jewish holidays. We had Rosh yes. Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. So yes. my phone has been off, right? And it's yes. been blowing up. So today is the first day back. Maz is busy putting away the sukkah. And okay, I'm sitting doing work. Um, I had seven people to call back. I did not call anybody back till I did the whole beginning. I've been sitting here for hours, did the whole beginning of what you guys were saying. Mm -hmm. I took notes and I answered these phone calls in a way that I've never done before. So it was like, I, you know, I, I looked at your script and then I said things like, so if you, in, if, if you will be in therapy with me and it'll be really successful, what would your life be, look like differently in a year from now? Mm -hmm like two or three people were like, no, I don't want to do any goals. I just want to sit with somebody. Mm -hmm. So you're not the right client for me. Ah, oh, I love it. Right. I sent, so I have two people that are two colleagues who are looking to fill up their practice. I sent, I sent them. And like, for me, it's like, oh, thank God. Cause you, you're just wrong for me. Um, one person said like, I'm not so sure. I told her my free schedule. She goes, no, absolutely not. Again, it, it was, it was great. Like they're not coming in and then we're not fighting about this or like, and I'm giving them a very low fee and then I'm upset. Okay. And then three, I booked. Yay. Congrats. And you booked where you guys were in alignment on what they were looking for, what you could provide, what the schedule was. And that like, it fell in flow. It wasn't just, let me take everybody and then sort it out in the office and then refer them out. And now you just saved, you know, four people from, and you <laughs> from having this experience, because again, I want you guys all to hear this. It takes more energy to onboard and refer somebody out than it does to screen them out during the consultation and only bring in people that you're pretty darn sure that it's a good fit. It will absolutely change your joy in your practice if you have right fit people coming in consistently. Well, congrats to you. I love it. And I love that you, <laughs> even though, and I want you guys to hear this, like, I'm so proud of you that you're like coming off of these holidays in a place where you could have felt like this obligation, I need to return calls as quickly as possible. I need to get back and then I'll sit down and figure out the rest of it. And you said, no, let me, let me, 
let me pause. Let me do this intentionally. Let me start to shift right now. Let me spend a couple of hours like digging into this and really thinking about how I want to be and how I want to show up differently. And then seeing the, the immediate benefit to that. Congrats. Just so happy for you. I'm, I'm so delighted. Thank you. Good. I'm glad it was a good experience. Uh, Let's see. Kelly was saying, um, I had a successful practice, but decided to take a step back because I was struggling to balance my family obligations and my business. I'm realizing the huge problem was a lack of support and network with other professionals. Yeah. Mm. I think, um, I think a lot of us are feeling that right now, which again is why I've been calling boot campers to remind them of that there is a community here for you yeah. to support you. And, um, I do, that is just something that I don't know how it happened. Maybe it's just because of who we are, but that's something that's important in anything we do. Even when mm -hmm. we individually coach people, we create a community around it. Mm -hmm. When we've uh, created our other community besides boot campers, um, that is just a huge component of it. We have a boot camper mixer on the sixth, and that's where we bring all the newbies and the alumni together. Um, to just connect and find battle buddies and to really um, remind themselves that they're not alone yeah. and that um, there are people you can rely on, whether it's someone across the country from you or whether it's someone right around the corner. Um, it's an aspect that I think we, we're built for community. We really are. So we had, um, I mean, we got to do these calls um, earlier in the week where we had a lot of um, former boot campers. And one of the stories um, that was shared was with a boot camper that they are successful, they grew into a group practice, and then their child needed medical care that wasn't available in their state. And so they were able to move to a place that worked better for the needs of their child, create the ability to manage the group practice from another state, but they actually made decisions about where to move based on visiting places where they had community from their boot camp community. Mm -hmm. And so now they literally have like, like their neighbors are boot campers, <laughs> right? Um, one of our uh, people, Arena, um, she joined boot camp and she already knew she was going to be having, um, being like moving, moving out of state, uh, moving out of state. And so she did boot camp <clears throat> to build up the practice in the new state. And then one of the boot campers became her battle buddy in that new state. And she moved into it already having a friend yeah. and this whole connection that they could have. And now their colleagues, you know, and people refer to each other again from not just states, but we do have people. Uh, we have throughout the world. So um, the UK, Canada, Mexico, um, Ireland, Australia, uh, Germany, um, on the Africa. Um, we have people, um, we're almost on every continent, but not quite. Yeah. Kelly uh, was saying, I'm really trying to figure out what direction I want to go moving forward. And I'm wondering what other options are out there for me. So having built a practice, taken a step back, I think you're in a fortunate place because it's good to reflect on the lessons learned, even if it was successful at that time. Again, what we were saying at the beginning, success is constantly being refined and redefined based on you and your growth and your circumstance and what is good for you. And I will say, you don't have to create the same practice again. And you don't have to create a traditional practice either. In boot camp, we have people with nature practices, body work practices, purely doing retreats, purely doing speaking and retainers uh, for con consulting, uh, supervision, clinical supervision, clinical trainings, um, courses and things like that, where they've decided, you know, I'm not going to practice in the traditional way. I'm going to use my talents and gifts and others. And it's a beautiful thing to have options. And it can also be a little overwhelming, but our hope is that in our process, we help you distill down the options into what fits into your life. And in the next few years of where you see your life being. Mm -hmm. And then as you integrate that, you again, continue to reevaluate. It is a process of action and reflection mm -hmm. throughout all of boot camp and beyond. 
Um, Wanda asks, uh, can you talk about your niche? I know what it is, but I also feel compelled to help a particular ethnicity or those with more mental health issues due to the limited clinicians in the area. This is something we're really um, passionate about um, is making sure that our communities of therapists reflect the communities we serve. Um, and that means in color, gender, ethnicity, language, immigration status, size, ability, neurodiversity, we welcome that. We think it is essential to the vitality of mental health care in our community. And Wanda, if you wanna mute and ask more about it, I will also say though that we are aware that as white coaches, white women, um, we've brought in some other people to talk about that. We do talk about that also in terms of like money and things like that. When you are serving, um, sometimes people will say, well, I wanna work with people that have like really severe mental health issues, which sometimes those people are more limited, those kinds of things. So it just brings up a lot of discussion about, um, about the intersectionality and how to still have a profitable business without continuing the oppressive systems that have oppressed the people that we're serving. And also the importance of honoring your own diversity and that beauty, um, like talking about how to still stay safe and be seen when you are a, a black woman and a, a person of color, an immigrant, or you have another language, those kinds of things. We talk about that, like, what does your voice smell like? How do you feel about your accents and things like that? I think it is important to explore all of that. Mm -hmm. And we want to help you figure out if that's what you wanna do, how do I do that in a way that's safe for me, that helps me still have a good life, and it helps me reach people. And it may be a little different model than what you're thinking. Like we, that's important to us. So Wanda, does that answer? I'm not sure, I feel like I'm babbling now. So do you have other questions? No, I think you did a good job. I'm, I'm understanding, I think it's just a challenge. Um, more and more as I work through it, I heard a part of the workshop last week. And so I was just kind of listening in to say, wow, how do I refine that? You know, of course, those days that I have what I consider my niche, you know, I wake up with the excitement of this is what I'm going to see today. But at the same time, there's also that pull for when I started, this was my target audience. Um, and while I still have that passion, um, sometimes maybe it doesn't seem that they're as open, maybe to what therapy. What is the niche, the can way. I ask? Uh, couples, for sure. Couples. Yes. And it, but what about the couples feels tough with your niche? Uh, Actually, that part is not so tough, you know, um, but I think working with others outside of that, once pers a person sees that you're a person of color, they need that connectivity. Uh -huh. um, and so when I look at, you know, counselors in the area, many times I might want to refer, but there's not really anyone around. Uh -huh. And so to normalize therapy for persons of color, yes. sometimes that's a bit of a challenge. Yes. Well, and I, I might even say like, there, there's often a bigger barrier, right? For a person of color to go into private practice because they don't have mentors, they haven't had good experiences. It can feel like it's a huge privilege to go out and work on your own. It doesn't feel safe to not have an employer, to not have benefits. And so this is why some of our um, clinicians of color that have gone through boot camp, being in a group practice owner has been incredibly powerful for them to be able to create sustainable jobs and give the option for more of the clinicians of color to have a place to go. Because a lot of the positions that are out there are huge burnout work and they're very low pay, they're not sustainable. And so people are like, hey, I need to like take care of my family. I've got student loans. I invested an incredible amount into this degree. And then in some states, then there's almost an expectation that as they're gathering hours for licensure to become fully licensed, that they do that for free or paid at some ridiculous substandard, lower than minimum wage once you count all the hours in wage, if we can create more 
corrective experiences and more like healthy places for pre-licensed and licensed clinicians of color to have good experiences in the field, they're not going to leave at the rate that they're leaving now. And that's why I love like the therapy for black girl podcast. And there's a lot of therapists that are showing up um, and kind of bucking the trend of, of being seen and creating safety in being seen, because what were you taught growing up? Even like, this is something I think a lot of white people don't know. What are you taught when you're going to have your house um, be appraised. You take all the pictures down. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> right. And that no identification. it will get appraised at a whole different level, but we want yes. you to be seen. And I think just your visibility alone can also shift some of that mental health stigma within the community, but also, um, there is, we have like groups of people that are organizing in boot camp to have discussions around this that refer to each other. But our hope too is that as you are more visible, it will also attract clinicians to work for, for you if you want that, but also create more of a sense of community to rally around because it is so important. And um, I'm loving seeing what some boot campers are doing with their visibility yeah. and addressing Black mental health, but also just mental health for all sorts of different kinds of groups of people that have often been neglected and private practice has often been seen as like the white rich people way to have services. And I don't, I don't believe that. Yeah. And I, yeah. I feel like if we're going to change mental health systems, our role as private practitioners is crucial to that. I, I, I think that we're the ones that have to get out of the box instead of continuing what the other systems have been doing for a long time. Hope that helps. It does, yes. Good. And I was going to say, in my challenges, I am more diverse, but persons are drawn to me because I am of color. But truthfully, I like diversity. So yes. sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge. But I think there are some things you could do in your marketing to help with that too. Okay. And, and in the messaging. Um, and some of that is the, yeah, marketing and messaging, I think can really shift that for you because I do believe I, I, I want to just affirm and he, say what I hear you saying is, is that I don't want to be known just as the black therapist. I don't, you know, and that's one thing we're conscious of. I don't, I don't bring in a, a person of color just to talk on people of color issues. I want to bring them in because they're an expert in DBT and EMDR, you know, those kinds of things. And so I, um, I think there's some marketing that we could do to help with that. So you can step out and be like, hey, no, this is who I am. And this is what I'm really good at. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with what you see right here. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with what's in here and in here. And I'm going to prove that to you through my messaging and the way I promote this business. Mm -hmm. Yes, hands down. I think that is essential. But I, I also think that mindset part and the sense of obligation that it almost sounds like you feel to take people in because there isn't an option externally. Well, I, I have to do this thing that we can maybe shift that. And again, let's get some other let's attract some other people into the field. Let's get you connected. Maybe it is maybe they're doing some virtual work for right now. And we're referring people out throughout your state. What state are you in, Wanda? Uh, South Carolina. South Carolina. Awesome. So maybe we can find some other Black clinicians in South Carolina who love doing that work that you can refer out to um, if you don't want to do group practice. Maybe if you do want to do group practice, maybe we start a virtual group practice. And so again, you have people where that's already naturally being attracted, but we can refer them out so that you are not feeling this sense of obligation because you are not obligated to do anything in your practice or in the therapy room that doesn't fit for you and your heart right. and your outcomes. Like, yeah, you don't gotta. Cool. Awesome. Nice Thank to you, meet you. For, for popping <laughs> on when Wanda and yeah. asking the question. I love it. There's a great Thank question you. from Jill. Are there good resources for attaining reasonably priced health insurance as a sole practitioner? Well, guess what we have in November? <laughs> we have a training on healthcare uh, for our private practitioners. Uh, this is going to be part one. We're not going to do it for group practice owners right now. We're just talking about you as the clinician. How do you get health care in the U.S. system? And, and it's not by a person who can sell to you. 
I mean, she could if you live in her one state, but she's doing it as a courtesy to educate our clients and um, we're paying her to come in and do this training and it'll be November 16th. Uh, and we're gonna go over like the different kind of healthcare options that you have as a private practitioner. Cause that is one of the biggest fears of people making the leap is what if I, you know, that happens, you know, I had my husband's healthcare, uh, he got laid off and it's like, all right, here we go. So, um, <laughs> and now we offer, benefits to our employees. And so we want people to be able to do that because your health is important for you to be able to continue to do this work. Um, all right, uh, Roxanne was asking about um, how we answer questions. And I was telling her that it's not one-on-one, -on -one, like you just get on a video with me and Miranda. In boot camp, you post your question in a group. Um, so everyone can see why do we do that? Because you have that question. There's likely out of the 2000 people in there, someone else has the question um, and everyone can learn from it. But we do respond directly to you during the live working session. So two weeks, twice a year, you have me and Miranda answering every single question. And if you are not fully licensed and you still have hours that you need to complete, some people choose to do boot camp um, because they want to come out of the gate with a full practice. Now in, in California, for example, if you're pre-licensed, you cannot own a practice, but in other states you can, and you just pay for your outside supervision. So we have pre-licensed people that can have their private practice. And then for states like ours, where we live, we have pre-licensed people who are laying the foundation. So when they leave, they take, they have a business ready for them. Like Joanne Kim is an example of that. She was, she came to us pre-licensed in California, was getting her hours. And when she transitioned into licensure, she had a full practice out of the gate. Yeah. And that, and a full practice that had a livable wage where she was charging the right fees from the beginning to sustain her. She had marketing um, that was ready to go. Um, and now just a few years later, she has you know, a newsletter list. She's launching a course. Um, yeah. She's a co-working space so much there. Jill had also asked about um, if it would be a good idea for her to start group practice at some point in the next few years, um, very part-time and regularly turn away many clients. You can actually have a part-time small caseload and start hiring. You don't have to wait till your caseload is full for you to hire. What it comes down to is doing, if you want to, this round, Joe, of boot camp, you can do it through the lens of, do I want to do a, pra a group practice in the next year or two? 